Good morning, church. We got everything on? Yeah, all the lights are happening. Good to see you in church this morning. You know, today is a kind of special morning for us. And um, it's special because we are officially uh, celebrating Liz Lanini's uh, miracle. And, um, and it's, not, it's not because it's the only miracle that we've seen in this church. In fact, over the last 20 years, we've, we've seen God move in people's lives. We've seen people be healed, and we've seen other miracles, um, but uh, especially over the last 10 years. But what we've never done is kind of like recorded the before and after of a miracle. And, um, and I think it's important to do that um, because, you know, it's easy to forget. And if you were to ask me, well, you know, what miracles have happened in church? You know, I might remember a few, but I certainly don't remember all of them over the last 20 or so years. And you know what? If, if we don't see miracles, if we don't see God um, actively moving in our lives, then, you know, church and, and in fact, Christianity is just really no fun at all. Because in the absence of the presence of God moving in people's lives in a, in a real uh, and tangible way, then all that we have is religion. And you know, religion just doesn't make it. Religion is not what God is all about. In fact, it was religion that actually caused the death of Jesus Christ. And so, in the absence of the presence of God, in the absence of God working in people's lives, then that is all that we have, religion. And I want more out of my faith than that. And so this morning, we're celebrating something that God is actually doing all the time. Um, you know, I, I, I don't know, um, you know, some of the questions, or one of the questions that's often asked of me is, you know, well, well, if God is healing people, then why doesn't he heal everyone all the time? And frankly, I don't have the answer to that question. Uh, I do know that uh, some people get healed and some people don't seem to get healed. And I think there could be reasons uh, for that. Um, uh, you know, there's some obvious ones that we can maybe make a note of. Um, but one thing is certain, uh, God is sovereign and he actually doesn't owe us anything. We need to remember that. You know, God has done everything for us in terms of coming down, taking on human flesh, and then sacrificing his life on the cross so that we can be forgiven of all of our sins. Why did God have to become man and die for our sins? Because God could not die. You know, you couldn't kill God, and so he had to take on human flesh and then willingly sacrifice himself, and that sacrifice that he made is enough to uh, have God forgive us of our sins. And so that was, that was an awesome thing that he did for us. And beyond that, he actually doesn't need to do any more. And so I think that when he does heal us, it's just a bonus. And it's awesome when he does do that, as he has done with Liz. Um, you know, I, I have always believed in healing. Uh, my very first healing was four days after I got saved. I didn't even know what was going on. I didn't even know what I got myself into. But I remember going into this meeting at one o'clock in the afternoon, and there was a whole bunch of old people, because that's what they do at one o'clock in the, you know, in the afternoon when they're not working, they go to meetings, you know, or whatever. But anyway, I was there with Bernie. Bernie took me along. And um, a, an evangelist by the name of Bill Sabritsky was, having um, words of knowledge for people. And he would point to someone and say, there's someone here with, with a, something wrong with your neck, you know? What, would you come forward? And so someone would stand up. And there's someone here with a, with a, with a bad uh, wrist, uh, you know? Uh, would you stand up? And, and people were reacting. And, and I'm thinking, I wonder what he paid them to do that. I kid you not, I, I was thinking that. But then at the very last, uh, minutes of, of this kind of stuff going on in my head, I, I was about to lean over to Bernie and ask her if he could uh, heal backs. And I, I had a back problem. I, I had back pain for, for a long time. was seeing a chiropractor every week for 18 months. And, uh, but funny enough, I wasn't thinking of myself. I was thinking of my mother, who had a very serious um, back issue. And so I'm about to lean over to ask Bernie, 
do you think he heals Max when Bill Sabritsky calls out and he says these words I've never forgotten. He said, there's a young man at the back of the room with a long standing back problem. Will you come forward, please? God wants to heal you. Well, I looked to my left and I looked to my right and I was the only young man anywhere near the place. And so uh, God, uh, so I went, I went forward. Now this is four days before this, I was a heathen of heathens. Didn't believe in God, didn't believe in anything like this. And so I'm walking forward. Anyway, to cut a story short, he prayed for me and I touched and he told me to bend over and touch the, the, the ground. And I did that for the very first time that I can remember. And, um, and then he sent me off. And, and, but before I left, I said, look, I really want you to pray for my mother. And so he asked, um, he hesitated for a moment and he said, oh, her, her spine is rotting. That's what he said, which was actually what was happening. And so we, he said, will you join me and, and pray with me? And I didn't even know how to pray then. But anyway, I did my best. And so we prayed for my mom. Three days later, I went to visit her, asked her how her back was. She said, well, actually, it's been really good the last couple of days. Nine days later, I went to visit her again. I said, mom, how's your back? And she said, well, you know, my back's been really good for the last couple of weeks. <laughs> and, um, and that's when I then shared my story of how I'd come to know the Lord Jesus Christ. And so the point I'm making is that from very early journey in my, in my, of, of my faith, I was exposed to healing. And so I've always believed in healing. Uh, what I've learned over the years, uh, and, and, and that may address this issue of why does God heal some people and, and he doesn't heal others. And I think that obviously faith is critical. Faith is important. Um, it's so important that, that there are times when both uh, Jesus and, and some of his disciples, uh, when they went to heal someone, uh, they would clear the room. So if there is unbelief in the room, Jesus said, well, get out. And, and then he would pray. And, um, and so clearly, unbelief can be a real issue. And unbelief can be an issue with, with believers. Like we can have faith for something, but then unbelief in other areas. The other thing that I've learned is that Faith, as important as it is, um, we also require an expectancy. We, you know, we all have faith. Jesus says that if you have faith as small as a mustard seed, and if you, those of you uh, have seen a mustard seed, it's kind of like a pinhead type size seed. And Jesus said, hey, if you have faith the size of a mustard seed, you can move a mountain. And the point that Jesus was making is that faith itself is very powerful. It doesn't need to be huge. And so I think as Christians, what we can sometimes lack is hope. Like we believe that God can heal, but we may lack hope that he will. We may lack an expectancy that he will. Okay. And so that can be a reason. Another reason is that, um, you know, sin, unconfessed sin. When I mean unconfessed sin, I, I mean things that we haven't owned up to. Um, that can be a hindrance. In, in James 5 verse 16, it says, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. The earnest prayer of a righteous person has great power and produces wonderful results. And so I shared this uh, scripture with, with Liz. Uh, I, uh, you know, uh, when I went to pray for her before we prayed for her at church, uh, I shared my, my experience with that scripture, which happened um, when Brittany and I visited a church in Nigeria where for nine days that we were there, we saw more miracles than we had ever seen, ever believed to exist. Um, their services, the Sunday service went for 12 hours and nobody was looking at their watch, you know. Um, and so we saw a lot of miracles there um, that kind of challenged my understanding. And I came back, I'll admit, I came back thinking, yeah, but that's Africa. You know, in Australia, it doesn't happen. You know, we, we, we have too much unbelief. And then I came across two people, Tom Fisher and, and Pete Cabrera Jr., two Americans, uh, sorry, um, Tom's, yeah, 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 they're both Americans. And, um, and so 10 years ago, I, I, I went to visit my parents and I decided to go via the States and visit these guys and spend some time with them. And, and you know, America's kind of like similar to us, you know, in terms of our belief system. And, and they, would, they would pray for people and, and they would get healed and they always recorded on video the healings so that people could see the befores and afters. 
And I was really challenged, and I, and I, and I showed this to the church uh, back in 2013, I guess, I think it was, um, a, 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 a video of Pete praying for someone, and he prayed for 32 minutes. Now, I've never seen a pastor pray for anyone that long. I'd never prayed for anyone that long. Um, I never heard of anyone praying for anyone that long. And the reason that Pete kept praying is because Pete had an expectation. And when the man wasn't manifesting his healing, he just kept praying because he couldn't understand why he wasn't healed. And that really challenged me. And what challenged me wasn't Pete's faith because I have faith. You all have faith. If you're here today, most of you, if you're saved, you, you have faith. And you have faith because, um, you know, you wouldn't be saved if, without faith. And so, but I was really challenged by his expectation. And, and when the man didn't manifest his healing, he thought, well, something must be wrong. Because he expected the man to be healed. And I was really challenged by that. And sure enough, 32 minutes later, the man was healed. He walked into his soup kitchen. Pete ran a soup soup kitchen at that time he couldn't even take his jacket off he was in so much back pain he walked out of there completely free and so that really challenged me to deal with the expectation and from then on when I would pray for someone I would pray with an expectation I always had faith you know the problem was that sometimes I'd pray for someone and even though I had faith I didn't expect them to be healed do you understand that now, that's maybe a terrible, um, a terrible uh, admission for a pastor to make, but, you know, you can't control what's going on in your heart uh, at the time. And so I admit that sometimes I would pray for people, and I, you know, and I had faith, but I didn't expect God to do something. And the reason I didn't expect God to do something is because maybe I hadn't prayed enough that week, or maybe I hadn't read the Bible enough that week, or maybe I had an argument with Bernie that week, or more likely she had one with me, or, you know, whatever. Um, and, and so I was bringing my spirituality or lack of spirituality into the equation. And you know what I've learned is it's got nothing to do with me. It's got to do with God's desire to work through people's faith to bring about a miracle in someone who needs it. And so once I learned to take myself out of the picture and recognize that all I needed to do is to understand that I am simply an ambassador of Christ, I'm a mouthpiece of Christ, and therefore when I pray for someone, it is not me, it's not any power that I have, because I don't, when I pray for people, I expect them to be healed because I am standing in the gap for Jesus. As his ambassador, I am using his authority, not mine, because I don't have any, right? So I'm using his authority to pray for healing. And that's what I did, as you will see in a moment, because that particular day that we prayed for Liz, I really felt to do what Pete Cabrera and Tom Fisher and many others like them do, and that is to record the prayer for healing and then obviously to see the result. And we couldn't see the result at that time because, you know, cancer is one of those things that can hide, you know. I mean, if you're blind, everyone can see you're blind. If, if, if you've had a stroke and you're crippled, everyone can see that. But when you have cancer, you've, you have this foreign DNA that's eating away at you, or rather growing in you, and it doesn't belong in there. And, and you'll see in the video that Liz looks perfectly healthy. You know, she, she comes up and she looks perfectly healthy, looks pretty much as she does today. But the doctors had told her that in... In, in a couple of months, she would be dead. And so that's how aggressive that thing in her was. And so, you know, um, we prayed for her, and I'm going to let her come and share in a few minutes her story. Um, but that particular morning, I just really felt, now I'm going to record this because there's going to be a before and an after. And here we are today, you know, months and months after the doctor said that she would be uh, dead and buried, and here she is kicking her feet up, and um, and so we are very delighted about that. So what I'd like to do, Amen. 
And so right now, just, just before I get it to come up, I just want to, for those of you who weren't here that particular day, just to watch that video of when we actually um, asked some people in the church that had faith to come and join me and pray for Liz. Levi, would you do that now, please? So Liz, w would you come up, please? Now, you know, Liz has just been so awesome. She's, I consider her a real godsend uh, to us. But Liz has been given a, um, a very negative and life-threatening report from her doctor. And, um, and therefore, I believe that uh, this morning um, is, you know, we have a need for faith because my sister needs a miracle. And the reason I read that scripture to you from Corinthians is because if anyone in this place right now feels that you are being given that gift of special faith, as the NIV puts it, the NLT doesn't call it special faith, but if, if any of you have noticed that you really sense this gift of faith, then I want you to join me. Don't, don't come just for the sake of it. If you do feel that, then I want you to come and join me because according to the scripture I just read from Corinthians, there is times when God will give one of you something that he doesn't give someone else. And so if that's the case, then I'd like you to join me. If not, then I just want you to just pray uh, because the corporate combined prayer uh, has uh, power as well. And I'm going to go through a certain dialogue with my sister because uh, I want faith to, to, to rise up in her. You see, we all have faith. What we struggle with sometimes is believing that God will do for us what we believe that he can do. And there's a big difference between believing that God can. I have no doubt that my sister believes that God can heal her. She's seen miracles before. And so I have no doubt about that. that what, what can happen to us sometimes is that, is that this thing comes into the back of our head that says, I know that he can, but, but will he do it for me? And so this is where that scripture that, that uh, Ryan referred to before, that faith is the assurance of things that we hope for, the evidence of things that we haven't seen yet. And so what is really important for Liz this morning, even beyond faith, because she has faith, she's saved. Without faith, she couldn't be saved. So we know she has faith. But what's really important for her to have, too, is that she has hope that today God will deliver her. Yes. And so, so unless she has that hope, her faith has nothing to hook its claws into because faith is the assurance of something that we hope for. Do you have hope to be healed? Amen. Okay. The other thing that I want to talk about is that we have been called to be ambassadors of Christ. And so this morning, I stand here as an ambassador of Christ. Now you should also, maybe you don't have faith for that. I have faith for that. And, and so when I pray for her, it is not me doing the praying because I have no power. But as an ambassador of Christ, what I do is I stand in the place of Christ as his authority to pray against what is threatening my sister's life. Do you understand how an ambassador works? Right? If our Australian ambassador in the States, if he goes and talks to Biden... then it's as if Albanese is talking to Biden. And so when I speak against this thing, it is as if Jesus is speaking. That's what I believe. Okay? And since, I, since that switch turned on in my head, then I have seen a lot more miracles. Because prior to that, I used to worry whether you know, I'd prayed enough that week, whether I'd read my Bible enough that week, whether I'd mistreated anyone that week that might have affected my spirituality and all that and and, and I'd pray for people nothing would happen because it was all about me and, and that's not right and so really it doesn't matter how I'm even feeling what matters is that I stand before you as an ambassador of Christ and I'm going to pray for you as if Jesus himself was praying and guess what Jesus never failed amen, amen. he never failed he never missed and so the reason I'm saying this is because sometimes we need to, to, to strengthen our faith. We all have faith, as Ryan taught this morning. We all have it. Without it, we wouldn't even be in this church. But sometimes we need to, we need to uh, stimulate that faith. And that's why I'm going through this dialogue this morning. Because our sister's life is under threat right now. And I don't know about you, but I am not ready to let her go. 
okay? And I'm sure Steve, Steve is even less ready. To, uh, and, and I'm sure that I speak for our whole church is that we're not ready to let you go. And I do believe that God is not finished with you. He's given you gifting. He's given you uh, an incredible ability to reflect the, 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 the very character of Christ. And so um, I don't believe for a moment what the doctor has said. And so right now, in the name of Jesus, I come against this tumor. In the mighty name of Jesus, I rebuke it. In the mighty name of Jesus, I command you to loose your hold off her body. And I command you to shrivel up and disappear. We thank you, God, for what doctors can do. But Lord, there are times when what they can do is not enough. But you are the great physician. And so, Lord, I, I, I'm doing what you have told us to do, Lord, to lay hands on the sick, and your word says that they will recover. And so right now, on behalf of Jesus, I say be healed and be restored. I rebuke every foreign cell in your body right now. In the mighty name of Jesus, I command you to go. Loose your hold off her right now in Jesus' name. We reject the words the doctors have spoken over you. We take them off you now. And we pronounce you healed and restored in Jesus' mighty name. Every foreign cell in your body right now, I rebuke in the name of Jesus and I command it to go. I command them to shrivel up and die and disappear. In the mighty name of Jesus, be healed. I pronounce you healed in the mighty name of Jesus. Not by my power, but by the power of the Holy Spirit. I pronounce you healed and restored in Jesus' mighty name. Tumor, go in Jesus' name. Tumor, shrivel up and disappear in Jesus' mighty name. Lord, let your glory defy the doctors. Let them, Lord God, be astounded and bemused, O oh God, and confused. Let their... You know, whatever, Lord God, let your glory be displayed, we ask in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. 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 Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. So that's how we did it. Um, and uh, at that time, I believe that God uh, started the miracle. Um, but it was a little bit after that that we found out it had happened. So Liz, why don't you come up now and, and share with us? Whoa, she's got a bag. She's got a bag of evidence. Now, if you want to advance the thing, just press that button and where you go. Thank you. We're right. Okay, we're there now. Yay, sorry. Yeah, as I said, this is my story. This is how I perceive what I went through. I know for my husband, for my kids, for my friends, we all, and we all went through it slightly differently, but this is my story. And it started on July 16th last year. It was my birthday, and we were staying with friends up at Jimboomba. I had a rotten sore throat and sore ear, and I had some antibiotics, so I got straight onto those. And I kept going, gee, my throat's sore. I've learnt a lot. If I said to you, where's your throat? You say you've got a sore throat, would you sort of point here? This is your throat, this is your neck. I've learnt a lot. Later in that day, my daughter from Melbourne rang with the most wonderful news to say that Ava Elizabeth named after Nanny, had been born. And I went to scream, I went to Yahoo. There was nothing because of this silly sore throat. And tears were coming down my face because I knew that our little granddaughter had been born. When I got home, the throat didn't get any better, so I rang, was in the days of telehealth and COVID. 
and my doctor sent me another script. At the end of that one, I asked for another one. He said, no way. And so he made me go in and he felt my throat and straight away he said, that's not a sore throat, that's thyroid. And he said, to be honest, I think it's a tumour. And I thought, wow, that sort of went from a sore throat to a tumour pretty quickly. Um, and he said, I actually think it's a cancerous tumour. I thought, oh, don't hold back. <laughs> you know? So that very day, we went straight down and had the first a CT scan, no, a ultrasound, and yes. So then I had to have the fine needle aspiration. And he started putting the wheels in motion to get me into the hospital system, because it takes time. So we decided to fly down to Melbourne and meet wee Ava and our little grandson Ryan. He was 18 months by then. Nothing was going to stop me not seeing her. But, and the appointments were going to um, get started. The day we came home was the 23rd of September. Today's the 24th, so just a year. And we met with the surgeon at Robina. That was the first person we had to go and see. He looked at my paperwork and he said, no way am I touching this. He said, this is way out of my league. And I'm thinking, okay, a bit scarier than I thought. And he sent me to Dr Rutherford, who is the top surgeon at the Gold Coast Hospital. Um, Dr Rutherford has only in his career done three anaplastic thyroid cancer operations. That's how rare it is. There are four types of thyroid cancer. Lots of people say, oh yes, I know someone who's had thyroid. This is anaplastic. 1% of any thyroid cancers is anaplastic. And the prognosis is three at the most six months of life. How do you react to that sort of news? How would you react to that sort of news? I was sitting in my massage chair one night, in the middle of the night when I wasn't sleeping, and I decided to work on a mantra with God that I could say over and over again to myself. And I decided with God that I would take the vulnerable pathway of sharing my journey as it happened. And I strongly believe that vulnerability isn't a weakness but a strength. And I believe that people can be at their most vulnerable but still be tenacious and show courage at the same time. So I promised God that I would keep my heart soft towards him. I would be just so in love with my family and friends that I would really respect my doctors and the nurses, that I would tell anyone my story, anyone who'd listen. And there's a lot of them out there that have heard it. And if God chooses to heal me, then I would, before surgery, then I'd go, then came the morning, the shadows vanish before the sun, death is lost and life is won because morning has come. But if I needed surgery, I'd say through it all, through it all I've learned to trust in Jesus and I've learned to trust in God. And if I wasn't well, then I'd go, his eye is on the sparrow and I know he watches me. I would regularly quote to myself a verse, John 10.10, 10, I've come to give you life, life abundantly, or as I heard it preached one day, life in full colour. And that is me, because I love my colour. And the other one, Philippians 1.21, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. I declared that I was living with cancer and not dying of cancer. This is all within days of hearing that I was not too good. I resigned from the Body Corp where I was at Meadowlands. I resigned from Kids Church and every other commitment I had because I realised that I was in for the fight of my life. But this one thing I know, God was still in control. So I had a PET scan, a CT scan, a contrast scan, an endoscope, a gastroscopy, 10 appointments in the first two weeks. And as I lay on the treatment beds, I rested in the promise that God knew what was happening and that he was with me. 
Some of those machines and tests are very daunting. But I chose to be grateful for the quiet time and I lay on those flat board beds being scanned for lengths of time, having tubes with cameras put down my nose and all sorts of lovely things. And when I went in for my gastroscopy, there were three anaesthetists and I said, bit of overkill boys, because I like to joke when I'm going in for surgery, because I do, <laughs> why not? And they said, oh, it's just in case you choke. And I went, okay, right, we've got gotcha. So they knew a bit more than I did. So while I was lying there, I worked on my Christmas list. I decided on the Christmas menu, right down to the cranberry sauce. <laughs> Don't waste time. Our daughter Vicky and baby Ava flew up to be with us when we met the surgeon for the results of all these tests. And he said he couldn't operate because the tumour had already um, was already compromising the carotid artery and the jugular and it had already was pushing on my esophagus and my trachea and I was in trouble. It was already too late for surgery. Hmm. Gee, I thought that was going to be the solution. So that's when I asked the doctor's prognosis and he said, because I was feeling really well, other than a bit nervous, I was feeling okay. And he said he doubted I'd make it to Christmas. How confronting. How do you process that information? So with tears in our eyes, Vicky's response was, well, we better go home and put up the Christmas tree. <laughs> Steve and I came home and cried. And he said he wasn't only losing his wife, he was losing his best friend. But we did come home and put the Christmas tree up. And Vicky's husband, young Steve, as against my husband, old Steve. <laughs> young St <laughs> so young Steve and baby Ryan came up to support Vicky so that Vicky could support us. And we always have Christmas party at our house. We've done it forever. And, but this party was in October, that, that very week. And we had family and friends come and we celebrated what we thought was why we could. I love Christmas. I love the promise that Jesus is coming. I love the, the promise that he's coming to save the world and to heal the world. And boy, did I need healing. So we put up the decorations and it was great. Vicky then got on her Facebook page and challenged people all over Australia and New Zealand to put up their trees and decorations. Um, and as they walked past, those that were Christians to just say a wee prayer, but whatever their um, spiritual practice was to send a blessing, there were over 200 trees that we know of that were put up in October and November last year. I have one Anglican friend who cracks it at me if I put my tree up early because, you know, she's very much into um, doing the advent and everything, but she put her tree up in October for me, bless her. So my first song had already gone because I couldn't have the surgery and I was sort of hanging on to through it all. I'll learn to trust in Jesus and I'll learn to trust in God. And yet again, another night I was sitting in the massage chair. I love my chair. And I made a deal with God. I don't know if you've ever made a deal or tried to make a deal with God. I said to him, if he saves me, I will tell my story to everyone. I said, now, now God, you know I've always been really good at sales, that I'm a, a born evangelist, <laughs> and imagine how good it could be to already have that built in, and I'll do it. And he quietly but firmly told me that he was quite capable of telling the story without me. <laughs> and that my only job was to stand. I thought that was a bit weird. Not sit, not walk, just stand in his promises. I believed I was to stand holding up the sword of the spirit. That's the Bible. I believe I was to stand 
with the breastplate of righteousness, the shield of faith to protect me against any more damage. But I was just to stand. And I don't believe it's a posture of passivity, it's a posture of power, just standing. And as I stood, I would say, he will do it. I will walk when you tell me, but until then, I will stand. And I'll say, my God is a great God. I will stand in the posture of perseverance, which I believe is the door to a miracle. I was told to stand regardless of what was going on. I was told to stand regardless of how I was feeling. And I was told to stand regardless of what the doctors were saying. And to say with confidence, you are a great God. You are faithful God and so, and no good thing will you withhold from me. I may have been feeling pretty old and sick and wobbly, but my spiritual scaffolding will hold me. I know everyone's story is different and some people, when they have something like this, they want to almost hide into themselves and do it totally privately and absolutely no judgment. I was just called to be different. I was told to stand. Now, where's my little button for photos? Oh, pop that one. Keep going. That's, not the, that's the one. My son, Andrew. Oh, wonderful, wonderful gift. He arranged for family photos. How amazing. We thought this was going to be the last family photos we ever had. So, Brody, of course, you know, and Remy in the front row, and Andy and Shana up the back. Baby Ava, who's now 15 months old, and Vicky and Steve, and a very grumpy looking Ryan. <laughs> Um, but before Vicky flew out, she held me tight. She looked into my eyes and she said, please don't die before I see you again. <laughs> Gee, thanks. Half an hour after she got to the airport, she sent me a, um, what you call, a link to a song by a guy called Dean Lewis. And he was actually talking about his father who was dying. But um, she sent it to me and it goes, so how do I say goodbye to someone who's been with me for my whole darn life? You gave me my name and the colour of my eyes. I see your face when I look at mine, so how do I say goodbye? That wasn't really easy to cope with. The next week I started chemotherapy and radiotherapy. After two weeks of chemo, we found it was distressing my liver and it had to stop. So surgery, no. Chemo, no. All I had was radiotherapy and prayer. I started radiotherapy five days a week, but on Fridays we had two sessions, so an eight in the morning and a four in the afternoon. And it wasn't to heal me. They kept saying, this isn't to heal you. This is just to preserve and extend the time you've got left. The first time I went into radiotherapy, they got this large sheet of green plastic stuff. And it was hot, they had it very hot. And they put it on my face. That's why I needed my big bag. <laughs> and they molded it yeah. into my face. Yeah. They molded it. And every time I went in for radiotherapy, they had this. And you can see the clips. They clipped me to the bed. I could not move. Sometimes they'd say, move your nose, just, and you go, yep, that's right. They had it so tight. Um, the first time it was still really hot and they're fanning it like mad until the mold set. So the second time I went and there it was with the clips on it. I always knew it was mine, it had my name on it, but it also had lipstick on the inside, so I knew it was mine. <laughs> I was also sent to the palliative care team. They wanted my enduring power of attorney. They wanted my advanced care directives. We spoke of where I would prefer to die, at home or in a hospice. 
then when I was with the oncologist, I said, asked, how would I die? And I'm not going to tell you, but he very, very graphically told us more tears when we got home. As Steve said, the worse the prognosis, the greater the miracle. <laughs> My pain and the changing of the guard continued as one dear friend or family member from Melbourne, from South Australia, from New Zealand, they just kept coming. They never overlapped, they just kept coming. Two or three days, three or four days. We had someone staying in our home from September to mid-January, every week. Um, they were there to help Steve. Sometimes they took me to the hospital, or sometimes they did something else to give Steve a break. They were there to say goodbye. They were there to say goodbye. And so, and that went on for two months. So in the two months, I had just decided to stand positive in the promises and be grateful. Oh boy, that's hard. There were days I did not feel grateful, but I decided to speak gratitude, speak it out, always. I'm grateful. I'm grateful when the grandkids turn up to see me. I'm grateful when the family pop in just to say hi. I'm grateful for the amazing food that was brought, for the texts, for the phone calls, for the flowers, for the candles, for everything. And I just said, I'm grateful, Jesus, for all this. The first few weeks of radiotherapy were pretty cruisy, really. And I didn't know what all the big deal was about. They said it would get worse, man alive, did they know a lot more than me. Soon I was struggling to eat or even drink. Many of you will remember I had a turkey neck. I got a bit worried about November that someone would mistake me and put me out for Thanksgiving. Um, I got to the stage, if I wanted to talk to someone here, I would have to turn. Because if I just turned my neck, it would crack. If I was on my phone, I would have to hold it here, because if I looked down, it would crack. People used, oh, they brought out the big guns of painkiller around about then too. I was on oxycoating and I was on fentanyl. Now fentanyl is 50 times stronger than heroin and 100 times stronger than morphine. How I even functioned during that time, I have no idea. People would sometimes say, see a photo of something, oh, you look great. As if I was going to post a photo of me looking really blah, or vomiting into a bucket or something. I, that's just, I'm a bit too conceited for that, I think. That wasn't where I was going. Round about that time, I lost my voice. Now, some people thought that was the miracle. Um, but when you've got a, a husband who's very deaf, we would often sit in the same room and text each other. And he wouldn't have a clue what I was talking about. He often doesn't, but you know. I had some people admit to me that they even rang my phone when it was like this because they knew it would have to ring out because I couldn't answer, just so they could hear my voice message and hear my voice again. I had brain fog like you've never heard. Uh, I just couldn't put two sentences straight some days. 26th of November, Vicky was up again, bless her, she came up yet again, and we rang the bell to say that I had finished 36 doses of, chemo of radiotherapy. So ring the bell and everyone claps. And I thought that was the end. Oh boy. That was the good news that we got to ring the bell. The bad news was, They'd do some follow-up in February or March. But when was I meant to be dead? Christmas. They were just, you know, trying to cheer me up. My prognosis hadn't changed. I had three, in the end, I had three um, specialists tell me they didn't expect me to make Christmas. Three different ones, a surgeon, the oncologist, and the radiotherapy oncologist. They said, we didn't expect you to make it. And even after I finished ringing the bell, they thought I had one month max to live. 
It was only meant to be buying me time. One of the specialists said they felt my strength came from my positiveness and determination. And I said that it was from my family friends who haven't left my side, either physically and generously doing all those wonderful things for me and for my God. But he didn't know who was on my side, did he? The symptoms of the radiation were horrendous and got worse and worse over the following month. My specialists described them as torturous and I completely agree. The vomiting and choking, let alone the turkey neck, just got worse and worse. The second week of December, the second weekend of December, on the Friday, my friend Wendy, who was meant to be here today but got sick and couldn't fly in from New Zealand, which I'm so sad about, she is a marriage, uh, well, not a marriage, a funeral celebrant. And so we decided that with her and Steve and I, we would go to the funeral parlour and just make our arrangements. Now, in saying that, I hadn't lost faith and I was hoping like mad we didn't need them and that's what we said as we left. But we were just looking at the prognosis and how my health was going down. That next morning, or the next afternoon, at Meadowlands, where we lived, we had our usual Christmas party, and Santa had come and all the kids, and then they put on an afternoon tea for me. Well, I couldn't speak, I couldn't drink, I couldn't eat, but I smiled sweetly, and they said some lovely things and thanked me. One little seven-year-old, bless her, she just said, I'm sorry you're dying, Liz. And I said, yeah, well, actually, I am too, you know. <laughs> um, dear girl. Then that night when I got home, I just was sort of drinking sips of water and stuff, but I started to choke, and I choked, and I choked, and I was vomiting and choking. Steve was rubbing there, bashing my back. Wendy was putting cold cloths all over me, and I went on for over 20 minutes. I was blue, and I think we all thought this was the end. They'd said if I started choking, don't bother calling 911 because by the time the ambulance got there, I'd be gone. And I think we all thought that this could be it. But this one thing I know, God was still in control. So after I recovered, we just sat with some pretty candles on and played some worship music and thought of songs for the funeral. But one I couldn't get out of my mind was uh, by Lauren Tully, and it goes, you don't have to worry, and don't you be afraid. Joy comes in the morning, um, troubles they don't last always. For there's a friend in Jesus who will wipe away your tears. Just lift your hands and say, I know that I can make it. I know that I can stand. I go, wow, there's my stand again. I know that I can stand. No matter what comes my way, my life is in your hands. With Jesus, I can make it. With Jesus, I can stand. No matter what comes my way, my life, whichever way, is in your hands. The next morning was the kids' church Christmas presentation. The next morning after all that. And I came along, not feeling my very best, still no voice, but I'd worked with the kids since June, July, teaching them a sign language song to present, and I wasn't going to let them down. And they were fabulous, and I was so proud of them. While Wendy was still with us, I said to Brody, my grandson, I said, Bro, do you know what a pallbearer is? And he didn't, so I explained it to him. And I said, you don't have to tell me now, but will you consider being a pallbearer for Nanny? And he just said straight away, of course I will, Nan. And then we went into God's waiting room. And we just stood there, waiting, in God's waiting room. But what was I learning? I was learning not to listen to people in the grandstands who offered their opinions, but to be supported and carried by those on the battlefield in the arena with me. I felt it was like a guard of honour, those who stood both sides of me and just held me up as I wobbled. 
In Exodus, we read how God told Moses to put his, raise his hands when the Israelites were fighting the Amalekites. And while his hands were raised, the battle was won. And when he got tired and his hands came down, the battle was losing. And then um, Aaron and Hur came along and they held his hands up for him. And there were days when my family and friends were like Aaron and Hur, not physically holding my hands up, but they were the ones that were my guard of honour who held me together as God was winning the battle to heal me. What battle are you fighting today? Might be health, might be something else. Have you got a battle you're fighting? Who's out there holding your hands? I told Pastor George I had 29 pages, but not to worry, they were in print 38, so that I didn't have to put my glasses on. <laughs> on Christmas Eve, when the family arrived for Christmas, obviously, for Christmas Eve dinner, little Remy came up and she said, where's your turkey neck gone, Nanny? And I said, it's there, because it was there in the morning, and it had disappeared on Christmas Eve. That night at dinner, Vicky, uh, Remy said grace. And firstly, she said, Jesus, I hope you're as excited about tomorrow as I am. <laughs> Being a seven-year-old, Christmas is a big deal. And then she asked Jesus to give me my voice back. And I'm thinking, oh, okay. Oh, doesn't God love the prayer of children? That next morning, Christmas morning, I turned to Steve and a little bit raspy, but I said, Merry Christmas. And we both sort of went, whoa, where did that come from? This one thing I know, God is a miracle working God. We still had no proof. We still had no signs. We were still waiting. One night I had a dream and I was in that dream for quite a long time. And then I came out of the dream, but I just, you know how you can sort of stay in the dream? And Jesus was with Father God and he had a bundle of things for him. And firstly, they were prayer requests uh, from my family and my friends. And one was a request from the high priest in Thailand. Friends had been over there and they'd gone to see the high priest and asked him to bless me. And God replied, oh, I haven't heard from him in a while. And so the requests kept going. One after the other, Jesus passed on the requests from these people who didn't necessarily know God or not know him as we were experiencing him, but asking him in their way to heal me. Then God asked Jesus about a small box he was holding, prop two. It was a little box, a bit like this. And he said, what's in the box? And Jesus said, they were tear bottles. Tear bottles. In Psalm 56, 8, it says, you've collected my tears in your bottle and you've recorded each one of them in your book. And God said, God said look, I've already got a, a big box of tear bottles for Liz. And he said, these are ones from people who don't even know you yet. And one by one, he'd hold up the tear bottle and hand it to Father God. A tear bottle actually looks a little bit like this, a bit bigger than this, but I couldn't find a real one. And what people used to do, you know when you try to put your mascara on, they've got these funny glasses that you can flip one side down so you can still see what you're doing? I've seen them advertised, so I don't have them. And it's a bit like that, and you put it there, and you flipped it open, and you'd catch your tears. And that was the tear bottle. And so one by one, these were handed over to Father God as well. Some were named. I know there was one called Trish, and Jesus said she cried for hours um, just asking you to heal Liz. And, and then he said, but Jesus doesn't, uh, but Trish doesn't know you. And he says, oh, but I know her. Which is so important, isn't it? And so one after the other, they were handed over. A few nights later, I had a second dream. Now, I don't think it was all the drugs I was on. I was coming off them by then. 
But this time I saw my mum and dad, beautiful Christian people, and they were in a garden of sunflowers. And Jesus had shown me many years before that the babies Steve and I had lost and other members of our family had lost were planted in heaven. And as they were planted, they came up as sunflowers. And that Jesus had appointed the gardener for that particular garden. I remember seeing it so clearly. And I thought it was Jesus himself. And then he turned and I saw it was my dad. And so there's mum and dad, both in the sunflower garden. And we had a lovely little catch up and I was aware that Jesus was there, but this time I didn't see him. And we had a catch up and after a while, my parents said very clearly to me, it's time to go. God still wants to do impossible things in you, for you, through you and for others. And it was as clear as that. And as soon as I heard that, I was back. I've shared with a few of you that at this stage I also got false guilt. I started to feel so guilty that I wasn't dying, yet people had been crying for me and people had been so sad that I was dying and it didn't seem like I was dying and I know it's crazy but apparently it's very common and I felt guilty that other people you know, had, had to put up with so much. Two months later again I was getting a bit grumpy with the hospital because I'd heard nothing. So I put my um, big girl pants on and rang the oncology nurse and said, what's going on? And she said that the PET machine, which is the one I was waiting for, the PET scan, had been replaced and it was still a few weeks off. I think they'd basically not worried because I was going to be dead anyway. Um, and so they quickly arranged a CT contrast scan which is sort of as good as a PET scan, but shows different things. A week later, I got the news. Um, Levi, this is where we run that first one now. That was what we had seen on the first PET scan. That read, that's my cancer, okay? And what's the next one, Tudor? The one on the left, it's gone. A few little bits of green, which they think are scar tissue when they tried to do a fine needle aspiration into them, they said it was like a rock, which is, um, you know, likely to be scar tissue. Isn't that, there's your miracle. Amen. That is your miracle. <laughs> Mind you, each time they did a scan, and you know scans all look the same to us. I said, just tell me there's no baby there. <laughs> but, um, it's just amazing, isn't it? The specialist, when he showed me that, he hugged me and he said, if anyone could do it, you could. And commended me on how I'd always told him that I was expecting a miracle. But, oh, this thing I know, my God, Je Jehovah Rapha, Yahweh Rapha, the Lord who heals. We were so grateful for the news a little bit overwhelmed and found it even hard to enter into the full joy of it at that stage. Um, I had no doubt that your prayers were like spiritual scaffolding, keeping me safe, and that God was using the doctors to remove my cancer. Some days were easier than others. But the aftermath of this gloomy treatment was so rough. My Christmas tree was still up. We're in March now. Um, and I kept it up. Eventually, we removed the baubles. I asked some of the ladies from church to come and we removed baubles. And then I, my Facebook friends said, yes, I'd like to remove a bauble. And each one who did, they had to tell me something, not necessarily about me, that they were grateful for. And we ended up with a bear tree. And I left that tree it was just before Easter, and I thought it was appropriate that I had a bare tree just before Easter, and I wanted to wait till the scan results came in again. So another CT scan were done in May. Again, the results showed no mass, no metastasis, and only those green markers. And they just said, well, it's crazy, but you know, you're not meant to be here. The, the surgeon, he just 
I think it gets a bit grumpy at me sometimes because I'm meant to be dead. He keeps saying, what are you doing? Yeah. Um, he, he contacted his colleagues in Brisbane and they said, we have no answers. No answers. <laughs> Pastor George had been asking me to share my story for a while and I kept holding back just in case. What happened if under the green mark there was cancer? I didn't want to embarrass or make a fool of God um, by saying I was healed and then I wasn't. But he and I had another one of our sanctified discussions about this time and he clearly told me that if at some later stage it returned or metastasized, that it didn't reflect on today's miracle. This is my miracle now. So over the last month, yet again, just now, I've had another lot of CTs and PET scans and the photos are the same. Nothing is showing. So th through this time, life has taken on a new meaning. The old normal is gone. <laughs> Things are now meaningless compared to my deep appreci appreciation for my family, for my friends for my church and of course for Jesus. Perspective took on a whole new meaning. I really looked at what matters in life. Family and friends are my lifeline, absolutely. And a few things I've realized is that the God in the good times is still the good God in the bad times. And the God of the day is still the God of the night. I realised in all this time, I never saw God's back. He was always looking at me. He never turned away from me. I realised that the sweetest miracles have usually bloomed out of a hard season fertilised with tears, both mine and yours. It wasn't the longest illness by far but I decided to do it with you. Somehow Jesus thought I was strong enough for it. I'm so grateful he had such a high expectation of me. But today, as every day, is a fresh day. It is so good that God, sorry, it is a good day because God has made it. A day full of possibilities and hope. I'm back on body corporate, I'm involved in the community, having fun with family, friends and the grandkids. I still have doctor's visits and tests most weeks. And this is the journey to date, the story of my miracle till now. A miracle that is also your miracle because you walked through it with me. Thank you for being part of God's miracle in me. I don't know what the future holds, but I do know who holds the future. And I pray that if you're in need of a miracle, whether it's physical, whether it's spiritual, whether it's emotional or whether it's financial, that you come to Jesus, even today, and ask him because, oh, he just wants to bless us. Thank you. On the wall. Amen. God bless you, Liz. <laughs> awesome story. Amen. You know, I mean, it's wonderful when God does a miracle like this and restores someone's life. You know, but the real miracle is that if he hadn't healed Liz, we would have been grieving. Steve would have been devastated. We would have missed her terribly. But she would have been parting like crazy. Because that's what faith in Jesus does. It guarantees us an awesome afterlife. And the Bible tells us that we can't even imagine. And some of us are very creative. But the Bible tells us that we can't even imagine what life is going to be like in the presence of God in his homestead. Jesus said he's gone to prepare a place. 
Now clearly, it wasn't time for Liz to go into her heavenly home. And you know, I am convinced that that because, as long as we live in this world, stuff happens, accidents happen, disease can come upon us. But you know, it is God who determines when we go. Amen. And I know that there's times when we have lost friends and family. And I know that we've only lost them, and I'm referring to Christians. We've only lost them because God wanted them home. Too bad for us but a blessing for them who have gone. So from our perspective, Liz, we are delighted that God has decided that it's not time for you to go because I do believe he has a plan for your life. I do believe that you coming to this church was going to be a blessing and it has been. And so we're very grateful for what God is doing, has done and will continue doing in your life. Now for the rest of us here, this is what... This is what Christianity is like. It's about having God involved in our lives. And, and you know, the healings of miracles, uh, uh, sorry, the, 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 the miracle of healings and so on are awesome. But you know what? God is doing miracles in our lives all the time by changing us. You know, some of us were trapped in, 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 in some behaviors that were not normal, that were quite dysfunctional. Uh, some of us were drug addicts and we couldn't stop. Some of us were, you know, um, uh, not nice people, um, hurtful people. And, and yet we come into, into a relationship with God and God just changes that. And the promise is that He will make us a brand new creature. And so God is able to do the miracle of changing who we are as he's done to each and every one of us here who profess him as Lord. And so if there's anyone here, and there's some new faces here I don't know, so I don't know your story, I don't know where you're from, or uh, maybe you came here uh, just by chance, or maybe you came here because you knew that Liz was going to be sharing her story. And, and so I, I don't want to miss this opportunity of giving you an opportunity to do what Liz did some years ago, and that is to surrender her life to the Lord Jesus Christ. And then live out the rest of your life with Him involved in your life. Uh, to do whatever needs to be done to help you live life better. Because that's what Jesus does. He doesn't guarantee um, a, pa a safe passage in terms of not having to deal with the things that Liz dealt with. It was pretty gruesome. You know, it was gruesome for all of us. You know, I was fighting between having faith that she would recover and having fear that she wouldn't, you know. And, um, and so, you know, we all go through these struggles. Stuff still happens. But one thing we must remember is that we have an awesome destiny to look forward to. We have a home in heaven that Jesus has safeguarded for us, that no one can take away from us. No sickness, no disease, no accident can take that away from us. And so if there's anyone here who maybe has been sitting on the fence for a while, you know, maybe you've heard Liz share with you before, or maybe you've heard someone else share with you before, um, and, 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 and like me, for three years, I've just kept saying, no, I'm not ready. Maybe you're ready today, and if that's you, I, I'd just like you to just give me a quick wave of your hand so I can pray for you. If you're ready to commit your life to the Lord Jesus Christ and have Him come and be a part of your life, from here on, not just, not just because of the wonderful destiny that you will be assured of having, but also just so that you can do life better now with God in it. And so if you're ready to do that, just give me a quick wave so I can pray for you. Anyone else? Awesome. Welcome, sister. I'm going to pray for you in a moment. Anyone else? Another one? Okay. Amen. All right. Now, those of you who maybe are too shy to put your hand up, I know what that's like. I did that for three years. I just welcome you to just say this prayer after me because becoming a Christian is the easiest thing that you can ever do. Staying a Christian is not always easy. You know why it's not always easy? Because sometimes it's so much easier to make the wrong decision. It's so much easier to do the wrong thing. 
And so if anyone ever tells you that, you know, those who, who want Jesus as Lord are just weak people who want a crutch, a crutch to lean on, let me tell you, it is not easy being a Christian. It's easy becoming one, but staying one means that we have to make choices that we would otherwise not want to make. Right choices I'm talking about. And, um, and so if you're ready to do that, if you're ready to become a Christian, then just pray this prayer after me. And the rest of us can join in as well because it won't hurt. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you that you love me so much that you sent Jesus to die for me so that my sins could be forgiven. And right now, Lord Jesus, I ask you to become my Lord and my Savior. I commit my life to you. Give me your Holy Spirit so that I can, with his help, honor you in the way that I live. And I ask you this in your precious name, Lord Jesus. Forgive me my sins. Save me and prepare that home in heaven for me. In Jesus' name, amen. It's as easy as that. And so if you're online and you've prayed that prayer, then, um, then please um, contact us, find a church, um, and join the family of God, because this is a journey that we begin from this day onwards. Amen. Well, God bless you. Let's uh, sing one more song, and uh, we'll do that together.